am so very moral. I am so moral, I'm the king of moral. And because I'm the king of moral, you should give me all your money. You should give me all your money and you should make me a higher position of status and power in society. Because I love power, I deserve power. Because I'm wonderful, I'm brilliant and I am more moral than you are. And I realise by being more moral and more clever than you that I can take advantage of your evolved capacity to like moral people and to want to help moral people by signalling my morality so that you give me your money, you give me status and you give me the high power and status in society that I deserve because I am extremely moral because I know, unlike you, that black lives matter and I'm so angry because I am so moral! Hello, 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 and welcome to the edition of the Utility Heretic. Now, today, I would like to talk about the issue of morality. I would like to talk about the issue of ethics. Now, this is something that I had to do as a person who uh, I did A-level theology, and then I did Christian ethics, you see, and then I did, uh, I did a theology degree, and we had to do a course in ethics, and I was always very sceptical of ethics, of this idea of ethics, and of, of people, of philosophers who would sit there and argue that, well, this is the morally right thing to do, or is this the morally right thing to do, or how can we argue what is the morally right thing to do, or I am, I am more moral than you. I have really thought through these ethical issues, and I have come to a, the conclusion that the most ethical thing to do, the most moral thing to do is this. And my view um, has always been to be rather sceptical of ethics, to be rather sceptical of the kind of people that argue that they are doing the morally right thing, that they are moral, that they are more moral than other people. And it seems to me that that is with good reason, because a very interesting paper was recently published by Ock et al. called Sig uh, Signalling Virtuous Victimhood as Indicators of Dark Triad Traits. Now, what dark triad traits are, ma are, are Machiavellianism, that is to say you are obsessed with power and gaining power, narcissism, that is to say, simplifying it a bit, uh, a, 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 a sense of entitlement, the belief that you're fantastic you're brilliant and you deserve an excellent life and other people should look up to you and other people aren't as important as you and that you should be only surrounded by other important people and you're basically better than and superior to other people. And finally, psychopathic behaviour, that is to say, lacking, to use that awful current in vogue phrase, a moral compass, that is to say that you don't care about other people, you don't care about other people's feelings, you don't, you're low in empathy, you're not really concerned about the feelings of other people, you're only in it for yourself. Now these are the three dark triad traits. Now what these researchers did, they did various studies that all found the same thing. As they looked at the issue of virtue signalling. Now what virtue signalling is, is symbolically indicating your morality. Um, it's symbolically indicating that you care about victims. Symbolically indicating that you care about the supposedly oppressed people. Not actually doing anything to help them, of course, but symbolically indicating that you care. This is virtue signalling. Now, virtue signalling is very appealing to people because, as we will see in a minute, we are evolved to like moral people. If people are moral, then we're evolved to want to be with them because we can trust them and they'll look after us and we'll look after them and it will create a more complex society in which everyone can get along. And so we're evolved to want to be with moral people. And so even though we have <coughs> sensors which allow us to see if some sort of perceive if someone isn't really moral and is just pretending, a lot of people who are particularly if they're trusting can be easily manipulated by virtue signalers, by people who aren't re con men really, people who aren't really moral but who pretend to be moral, who indicate that they're moral, who do all they can to showcase that they are moral, the Pharisees types that Jesus was so uh, un unhappy about, the people that want you to know that they are highly moral rather than just happy to just do nice things behind the scenes and not get any credit. This is virtue signalling. Now, what they did in the study was they measured the extent of virtue signalling. They measured how often people virtue signal, how often they showcase their morality, how often they talk about their morality, how often they do things to indicate symbolically that they are moral. And they correlated this with these dark triad traits, things such as entitlement and the, 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 the propensity to cheat other people and all this sort of thing. And what they found were significant correlations ranging from about 0.1 to about 0.6 on various measures between dark, these dark triad traits and virtue signalling. In other words, something that I think is clear to us <coughs> 
those of us that know anybody who is a virtue signal, who know who know anybody that puts on Facebook, you know, Black Lives Matter or something as part of their Facebook profile. Who these people are not genuine. These people are not genuine at all. Uh, these people are not really nice people. They're in fact the opposite of nice people. The people that virtue signal, the people that go on Black Lives Matter ra uh, rallies, the people that do these kind of things, the people that want people to know that they are highly moral are in fact the. It's almost a sort of projectionism. They are the opposite of moral. They are, if morality is to mean anything, if, 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 if their understanding of morality is to mean anything, i.e. Uh, you're being kind and genuine, um, they, they're the opposite of that. They're very nasty people. They are high in dark triad traits. And this is what is indicated um, by this research. People who virtue signal, what are they doing by virtue signaling? They're basically trying to extract resources from the community. Um, it's, it's correlated with these traits, A, because it, they want power and extracting resources is a way of getting power. Signal your virtue to people that like virtuous people, that like moral people, is a way of trying to get power and a way of trying to transfer resources basically to you. So that's where the Machiavellianism comes in. Uh, secondly, they obviously feel they deserve power, they, they're entitled to power, they should have power, they should have resources, and that's where the narcissism comes in. And thirdly, they're obviously prepared to lie. They're hypocrites. They're not really virtuous, they're not really moral people at all. Uh, they want power and they want money, but they will signal that they, they will lie to the community in order to extract their resources. And in doing so, of course, they will get themselves jobs. Uh, by virtue, by signalling their virtue, they will get themselves jobs in a, in an academia, which is increasingly focused around these dogmas. It's increasingly a kind of church focused around these dogmas of equality and uh, whatever it happens to be, and, and and kindness and harm avoidance, and these these dogmas that this church has now developed, and they will get themselves jobs within that within that church within that context. And so, consequently, that is what they're doing. So these are people that we really should not trust. Are uh, people that go on about their morality and how moral they are, how unselfish they are. And the, one of the reasons that we shouldn't trust them is, uh, is this issue of ethics, which I now want to go into, uh, which is that there is no such thing as an unselfish act. And there is no such thing as an unselfish person. And that becomes clear if you understand ethics and understand morality from an evolutionary perspective. Now, the squire of our local pub has put me on to a very interesting book, uh, The Origins of Morality by Dennis Krebs. And this basically looks at the evolution of morality, the evolution of our sense of morality. Where has our sense of morality come from? Why is it that in pretty much all societies there is a there is a sort of there is variation, but there is a shared sense of what is morally good, what is considered to be moral behaviour. Well, this, and, but there's, there's variations, we'll see in a minute. Well, this comes from evolution. We are evolved to behave in these ways. Now, he comes up with five basic moral precepts, uh, five things which are, in general, in all societies, to various degrees, considered moral behaviour. The first is deference and obedience to legitimate authority. Ultimately, particularly in times of crisis, we regard we, we, we come together as a community and we regard those um, who are prepared to obey the rules, basically, who are prepared to wear the mask and whatever, as good. The people that are different to authority. The second is self-control versus indulgence. The third is altruism versus maliciousness. The fourth is fairness versus unfairness. And the fifth is honesty versus dishonesty. Now, um, there are of course, conflicts between these. So sometimes altruism, i.e., saying something, let's say saying something nice, saying, "Oh yes, that's a jolly good haircut you've just you've just got off when you when you look awful," can conflict with honesty versus dishonesty. And this is where some sort of ethical debate might come in. But this, he argues, are the, are the basics of what's going on. Now, of course, Jonathan Haidt, who you may be familiar with, has reduced this down to another five moral foundations, which parallel these fairly strongly. One is liking hierarchy, loyalty to the group, a disgust response, so a, se a sense of what's disgusting and what's pure, uh, fairness, uh, and harm avoidance. Anyway, what Krebs, Ar Krebs argues is that we feel these, we somehow feel these to be right. And what Krebs argues is that we feel these to be right because it makes complete sense. We have been adapted under natural, under selection pressures, under natural select, under individual selection, under sexual selection, under kin selection, under group selection, under social selection, um, to feel these to be the case. Um, now, what are the? Uh, they elevate our fitness to feel these to be the case. So we are evolved towards these strategies. Now, you could have a completely selfish strategy, a strategy where you're utterly selfish and you just act 
for yourself. But this is not seen as moral. And it's not seen as moral because it's not good for other people and it's not good for the group. So how have these things come about? Well, first of all, deference to, deference to authority. Under um, prehistoric conditions, um, humans uh, were evolved to live in certain groups. If you weren't sufficiently deferent to authority and to the, the, the alpha male and to the dominant people in the group, um, you would get yourself killed. And so therefore you wouldn't pass on your genes. And so on an individual level, therefore, we feel we, we are evolved to have deference to authority. It is natural to have a certain degree of deference to authority. Not too much deference to authority. We would expect those at the bottom of society or those who were competing to to, to, to get into positions of power, to be less deferent to authority. So there would be variation. But you can see how we've been evolved to have deference to authority at the individual level. You can see it again. He doesn't actually look at this, but you could also see this in terms of sexual selection. So people, women are going to be sexually selecting for the best possible men. The men who are able to get on with other men and have lots of alliances and not get, them, get into fights all the time will be considered to be more stable men, men who will be more likely to have resources, men who will be more likely to invest in them and invest in the offspring and whatever and be more stable and so they will be sexually selected for. It would also work in terms of um, kin selection as well. You're, if you're if you're deferent to authority then you're more likely to be deferent to the, the the authority, the views of the group. The views of the group may well be that you should invest in your offspring and, and be a good father and whatever and so it'll be selected for on that level. And finally social selection. Obviously if you, were, if you have the right level of deference to authority then you will be more likely um, uh, to get on with other people, to not get into fights, not get yourself killed, to make alliances and therefore you're going to be fine. So we have a evolved to have this deference to authority. The second is self-control versus indulgence. Well, what is self-control? Self-control is the ultimate selfish strategy. It's just, I will take everything. I will take what I want. And if, you, if it's a problem, then I will get into, you get, we'll, 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 we'll fight over it. And, 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 and that's that. Now, as we develop more, we develop more complex groups, we, we, we will get into um, a situation where we have to get on with other people. Those who are totally lacking in self-control will get into lots of fights. They will get themselves killed. They will get themselves cast out by the band. They won't pass on their genes. Therefore, they're out. In terms of sexual selection, those that lack self-control will be sexually unattractive to women because they will be more likely to love them and leave them. They won't, want, they won't invest resources in them and therefore the women will select against them. Those that lack in self-control and are utterly selfish won't invest in their kin. They won't invest in their children, their offspring. They'll just just invest in themselves and so consequently uh, their genes at, the, at that level will be less likely to be passed on as well. And finally we have to look at it in terms of what's called group selection. Now group selection is criticised without any merit as far as I can see. Um, basically, it's an extension of kin selection. So you can pass on your genes directly by having children. You can pass on your genes indirectly by investing in your kin, your nieces and nephews and whatever. And what ethnic groups are, and this has been shown by research by Frank Salter and many other people, is they are extended genetic families. And so consequently, you, if you invest in your second cousin or your third cousin or your fourth cousin, two average English native English people are about 12 cousins. And therefore, if you invest in an English person over a French person in a situation of war, you are elevating your genetic fitness to a greater extent. And so at the at the level of a group selection, you're going to get groups that come into conflict and computer models have shown that the group that is more internally cooperative, i.e. they invest in each other, uh, they are more positively ethnocentric and more externally hostile, i.e. they fight off the aggressor who is genetically different from them, um, they are more likely to dominate the grid in these computer models and more likely therefore as a group to pass on their genes. And so the group that is more self-controlled is more likely to pass on its genes at, at that level as well. And so you can see why a sense of self-control will be considered moral. The third issue is altruism versus maliciousness. Again, we can see how we will have been selected to be altruistic. Why? Well, first of all, the person that is totally unaltruistic won't be able to get on with anybody and will be cast out by the band and will be killed. Secondly, in terms of social selection, the person who is altruistic will receive altruism in return um, and therefore will be more likely to survive and more likely to pass on his genes. Thirdly, the person that is altruistic to, um, to his own kin Obviously, it's going to be more. It's going to be more likely to pass on more of his genes than the person who is simply utterly, utterly selfish and only thinks of himself. Fourthly, altruism and displaying altruism, making it known you are altruistic, 
is more like it's going to be attractive to women because women are in a situation where they have something to lose from the sexual encounter. They can become pregnant. They can be encumbered with a child. And so consequently, they want a male who is of high status and who is not going to simply love them and leave them. It's not going to simply pump and dump, as the phrase has it. And so consequently, they want a man who will evidence his altruism um, and who will invest in them. Similarly, the other way round, the man doesn't want to be cuckolded. So therefore, a, a woman who is low in altruism, who is utterly selfish, may well cuckold him. Um, so she doesn't follow the rules. She's not altruistic. She's not ag agreeable. So she's no good. So you don't want a woman like that. Whereas if the woman is altruistic, if she displays her altruism, if she's high in altruism, um, then you would expect the man to be sexually attracted to her. This seems to be much more important to men than women. It's actually quite noteworthy that women are higher in altruism than men. They're literally higher in it. And this would make sense in terms of sexual selection, because to the extent that men have to invest in women to get sex, they're going to want to w women who are altruistic, who are not going to cuckold them. So altruism will become perhaps more important to men than women, whereas simple financial resources, which can be a product of altruism to some extent, but is more a product of things like intelligence and whatever, is going to be more important to women. So therefore women are higher in altruism than men. But you can see how this would be selected for at the individual level, it would be selected for at the sexual level, it would be selected for at the social level, and it would be selected for at the group level, because the, 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 those that were internally altruistic and externally hostile, those groups would be more likely to survive. Fairness versus unfairness. Again, this can be um, ultimately understood in evolutionary terms. You have to have a group which gets on. You have to have a group which cooperates. So there are two um, fundamental desires that we have as, as pack animals. One is to reach the hierarchy, the, the top of the hierarchy, and thus be more likely to pass on your genes. Because under prehistoric conditions, this is of course well known, and there's interesting research on uh, contemporary hunter-gatherer tribes that looks at this, that the <clears throat> Uh, the, the about 50% of these hunter-gatherer tribes don't breed, more than 50%, about 60% of these excellent hunter-gatherer tribes don't breed. Why? Because the women sexually select for the top males who have the greatest access to resources that they can invest in them, and therefore the top males have lots of wives, the beta males have a few wives, and as you and a few children, and as you move down, the, the lower status males that the women are interested in don't have any children at all. So it's very important to get to the top of the hierarchy in order to pass on your genes. So we have this desire, this built-in desire to get to the top of the hierarchy, but we also have this built-in desire for cooperation because we have to have a degree of fairness and whatever because, uh, because so that we can maintain, in terms of group selection, a cohesive society that will fight another cohesive society and that will triumph over that cohesive society. So consequently, fairness becomes very important to main, at, at the group level. It obviously becomes important at the individual level. If you're going to be conned and manipulated, you're not going to get very far in terms of resource acquisition um, and, and, um, and at all other levels as well. So we're evolved to like fairness. And finally, honesty versus dishonesty. Well, you could say that this is an element of the, exactly the same thing. We have to be able to get on. We have to be able to cooperate. We have to be able to trust each other. Now, I've looked in other videos, and, and this will therefore be evolved for, we will be strongly evolved to like honesty and to be very, very cautious of dishonesty and to not like dishonesty and to try and root out dishonesty. Any group that has free riders, that has people that are parasites off it, is less likely to survive. Individuals that have free, who have to deal with free riders, people that are parasites off them, less likely to survive. At the sexual level, the woman is going to look for honesty. She wants honesty signals of the genetic quality of the male. He wants honesty signals of her genetic quality and also of her virtuousness and whatever. And so therefore, if a person is a liar, it's extremely important. Um, this is in all cultures, you know, people don't want to be with people who are liars, they would be less likely it would d damage their genetic fitness, they would be less likely to pass on their genes if they weren't able to root out liars. Now, Krebs notes, that there are a few other interesting things uh, in this regard, a few other nuances. One of them is the attitude towards how you treat those that are genetically similar to you. This is known as part of Hamilton's rule. The idea is that you will put in more effort to help a person who is more genetically similar to you. And this makes a great deal of sense because the more genetically similar to you they are, the more you are passing on your genes. So uh, many, many, many people may well lay down their life for their only, for their, if, if they, particularly if they are past childbearing age, for their only child, because it's heavily, heavily in their genetic interests to do that. They will be less inclined to do that, particularly if they have their own children and they could have other children, uh, for someone that's more genetically distant from them, such as a cousin. Um, and they will be very, and they will be much less inclined to do that. Though they can sometimes do so, um, if the people are even more genetically distant, such as a member of the same ethnic group.
Now that being the case, there are situations such as where the entire ethnic group is in peril in a situation of war, where somebody, a man, let's say a soldier who is childless, can be induced to lay down his life for his group. But there's simply, uh, it's simply less likely uh, and, and uh, th there is more at stake in order to induce them to do so. So one moral rule that we all also seem to have is that we are more, we, we invest more in and are more concerned about those that are genetically similar to us than those that are genetically distant. And one of the things that you often see on documentaries when they'll talk about dictators and they'll say, oh, he killed half a million of his own people. Oh, it's Pol Pot killed half a many million of his own people. Stalin killed half a many million of his own people. And that's a very interesting remark because it implies that it, well, it's not as bad to kill millions of other people. Uh, people of a different ethnic group. But you look after your own. You shouldn't kill. You, you shouldn't treat your, your own people like this. You know, that's 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 more of a problem. Another uh, sidetrack on this is the issue of, of disgust sensitivity. So certain things are considered immoral because people regard them as disgusting. Some people will say, I don't know, uh, bestiality or something is disgusting and it's it's therefore immoral. Now this, I suppose, would fit into def to, to, to to the other uh, moral precepts laid out by Krebs, such as deference to authority or or. Um, uh, 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 obedience to uh, obedience to authority or possibly altruism versus maliciousness it could just about fit in um, or perhaps it should be a separate thing and there should be a separate concept of, of, of doing things that are disgusting versus doing things that are not disgusting but either way what you can see with this analysis is that what you're dealing with is um, something where, where morality has come from where our moral sense has come from is a, a means of elevating our genetic fitness as individuals, our genetic fitness as kinship groups, our genetic fitness as tribes, our genetic fitness as ethnic groups, our genetic fitness as groups overall. That is what these moral strategies do. And when you do something which offends against these, then that is considered um, to be uh, you know, immoral behaviour. It's kind of built into us. This is immoral, we feel it's immoral, and we are evolved to feel it's immoral, because those that don't feel it's immoral are less likely, under the conditions to which we are adapted, these pre-modern conditions, um, are less likely to pass on their genes. Now, in particular, we are adapted to these conditions of intergroup conflict. And so, therefore, the most moral strategy is the strategy which at the individual level is considered selfless. Now a person could, a person could, um, you know, you could pass on your genes by going and uh, uh, elevate your genetic uh, uh, interests by going up to a rival for a girl and murdering them. That's elevating your genetic interests. But the problem is that that's not, that's causing a problem in terms of the genetic interests of the group because it's creating intra-group conflict. It is considered much more moral, however, to go out and, uh, historically anyway, to go out and battle with another group and kill people that are in another group for the good of your group. That's considered and moral behaviour. That's pro-social. That's moral. That's justified. So consequently, um, it is that specific level of morality, that level of, of selfishness, um, that is that is perceived as moral, the good of the group, because we are this evolved um, to be this this group species, this 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 group oriented species. But ultimately, it's still a selfish act. So ultimately, if you um, if you feel this strong sense that you oh I, I need to help these people that are that are that, that are that are that are poor, well, that's still that's ultimately therefore you're doing something that you're evolved to want to do, and it makes you feel better to do it. Why does it make you feel better to do it? It makes you feel better to do it because doing that creates greater fairness in the society and creates um, a, a, a creates greater bonding in the society, creates a more internally coherent society. And why is that good? Well, that's good because it allows the society to be to, to act to be to be uh, more successful in terms of group selection. And why is that good? Because ultimately it helps you to pass on your genes indirectly. So ultimately, it's a selfish act. It's A, a selfish act because doing it makes you feel better. And it's B, a selfish act because, uh, because doing it is ultimately in the interests of your fitness. So this is the crucial thing. There is no such thing as an unselfish act. The act is either w whether you are openly selfish because you are acting at the individual level whether you are slightly less selfish because you are helping your kin and you are kind to your kin, or whether you are slightly uh, at, at another level of, le of less selfish because you are helping your group and you are acting in a group-selected way, or even if you are acting in the interests of humanity. 
ultimately you are still acting in terms of your genetic fitness in some way. And in doing so, you may also, by doing that, and by being seen to do that, and by being known to do that, you are also acting in terms of your individual fitness and your kin fitness. So there is no such thing as an unselfish act. Now, there are variations <clears throat> in the extent to which people feel the, these different moral precepts. So some people, particularly people who are left wing, feel very strongly that what is important is fairness and harm avoidance. Those are the most important things. Uh, there are people who are right wing, feel those are important, but they also feel that, that, that hierarchy is important, that loyalty to the group is important, and that um, avoiding disgusting things is, is, is important. And from this you get ethical conflicts over what is ethical. Now those, when I was at university, um, these ethicists who would argue very carefully over what was the right ethical thing to do, what was the non-ethical thing to do. All they are really doing, therefore, is taking how they feel, their moral feelings, what they regard as morally important, their feelings, and coming up with superficially logical ways to justify it, i.e. coming up with a shared vantage point. Do you accept this? Yes, I accept this. I accept this shared vantage point, the, the, the golden rule or whatever. And therefore extrapolating from that, that what, what you should do in a sense of circumstances. But it, it's very easy, uh, if, you, if, if, if it's a different set of circumstances, to come up with some other uh, shared vantage point, um, to, 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 to appeal to some other uh, evolved moral sense, and to extrapolate that into your ethical guideline onto how to behave. And with some people there are going to just be fundamental differences. They will never agree, because some people will always think that the, first, <clears throat> the most important thing is fairness and harm avoidance, and other people will think that the most important thing is or, or, or hierarchy and structure. And it was, it's very, very difficult, therefore, for them to agree on what to do. And so as far as I can see, all of these philosoph philosophical ethicists like Peter Singer are doing is just attempting, there's no underlying logic, they're just attempting to superficially showcase the, how ethical they are, how virtuous they are, and, how lo and also how logical they are, because that's another thing that we, we like as, as, a, as a complex species, we like highly intelligent, logical people. Um, and that, that's that's about all. And that's why I think that ethics is as a, a whole the whole notion of ethics is a load of nonsense. And that also it's interesting that if you look at the kind of people that do philosophy degrees, by the way, they tend to compared to scientists, they tend to be low in agreeableness, low in conscientiousness and high in neuroticism. And what does that, scientists being the opposite. Now, what does that mean? Well, people that are low in agreeableness are going to be people that are going to be, have, be more likely to have dark triad traits anyway, and therefore more prone to showcasing how ethical and showcasing how moral they are. And people that are high in neuroticism, neuroticism correlates with um, extrinsic religiosity, i.e. you want to showcase your religiosity, you want to showcase the extent to which that, you, know, you are conformist to the group set of morals and whatever, you'd like to showcase that because you are worried about what will happen if you don't showcase that. And it also is correlated with a, a lack of intrinsic religiosity, i.e. a lack of genuine belief, a lack of genuine sort of moral belief. Um, and so it, I'm not surprised that those are the kinds of people that do it. So as far as I'm concerned, screw ethics, here's ethics, this is what I think of ethics as a discipline. Screw it up. Screw it up. It's nonsense. Ethics is nonsense. And the people who go on and on about how ethical they are, are high in psychopathic, narcissistic and Machiavellian traits. They are the opposite of what they say they are. It makes sense that those people form groups with names like hope not hate and go on about how you shouldn't hate people. Because in reality, those people are very high in hate or at least they are incapable of genuine love. They don't rest in peace, they rest in power, and that's what's important to them, and we should never forget that. Well, if this has been of interest, then uh, please, 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 please subscribe. It really helps if you do that. Remember that I live stream on Mondays and Thursdays at 7 p.m. UK time. If you want to help the channel, you can, you can see ways to do so below, and you can also send an offline super chat, and I will answer it. And I will see you soon, and... Uh, Goodbye!